Hello everyone, welcome to my talk. Today I would like to chat about a fun project I built called Row API. I started this project to solve one of the pain points that I have faced in the past, which is to serve production data pipeline output for online use cases. So quick self intro, I'm QP and I currently lead the core software teams at Neuralink. My team is responsible for building the infrastructures to support other engineers at the company to build the state-of-the-art high bandwidth brain-computer interfaces. In my spare time, I work on a wide range of open source projects. Two of these projects will actually be covered in this talk. So before I dive into the technical details of Row API, I would like to give a quick overview of exactly what kind of problem that I want Row API to solve. So this is a very typical data pipelines I'm sure all of you are familiar with. On the left side, we have data from relational databases. We have events coming from the client and we have logs from different services. And all of this data gets sent to a distributed message queue. And on the other end, we have a bunch of compute engines that will consume these messages and um, transform them, compact them into um, efficient file format, typically Parquet, install these files, store these files as objects in a highly available object storage. This works pretty well for internal offline use cases. For example, if you need to generate dashboards um, on hourly or daily basis, or if you need to train an ML models, it all works pretty decent. But when you need to serve this data to your external users through an online API that usually requires low latencies and high concurrent read traffic, you have to do a lot more extra work. For example, typically what people would do is to spin up another compute engine job, load these data into memory, export them into online data stores. All right, so the, there are typically two types of online data stores. One is you know relational databases like MySQL and Postgres, and the other type is key value data stores like DynamoDB and Redis. So depending on the online um, traffic use cases, you pick one of these two. And then at the end, because all these databases they speak their own binary protocols. You have to wrap a REST API APIs on top of the databases so that it's more accessible to um, users who are using browser or mobile clients. So now let's take a step back and think about whether these online data, data stores are really the right solution to the problems we're trying to solve. So if you look at these data stores, they're all designed for highly concurrent, high frequency write request patterns. Right? So for example, Postgres and MySQL, typically you can use these data stores to handle you know, thousands or tens of thousands um, writes per second. But if you look at um, data pipeline output, it's the opposite. Right, so typical production data pipelines that writes data out to data warehouse or data lake house, these updates happen at a much lower frequencies, right? At the maximum, you might have, you know, streaming jobs to write out to the, um, the lake house tables um, at a single digit updates per second, right? Most of the times, these data warehouse tables or lake house tables get updated hourly or even daily. And on the other hand, we also have, uh, these data pipelines also have really small amounts of writers, right? I would say the majority, majority of the time, you only have a single job that's producing the output to downstream tables. And sometimes you might have, you know, five or 10 jobs that's doing concurrent write to a downstream table. So compare this to, you know, 
the kind of workloads that online data stores handles, which you will have you know, a couple of thousand requests per second and um, you know, tens of uh, millions of users online, they are really different set of workloads. So this is where row API comes in. So the project itself is fully open sourced on GitHub and the main goal of the project is to make it really easy to spin up a production ready read only query interfaces for slowly moving data sets. It's built on top of Patch Arrow and Data Fusion. I am a contributor to both of these projects and it's written in pure Rust. Right, so that means the whole code base gets compiled into a single statically linked binary and it's really easy to adopt and deploy. So going back to the original pipeline design, you know, if we remove the need for having to support highly concurrent, high frequency write request, we can simplify the whole design by a lot. Effect effectively, we can remove all the complicated code that's there to design to support these write use cases and we can only focus on the read um, code path. So we have this single binary that can replace the Spark job that we have to export the data to online data stores and we can, it can also replace the online database itself and you also don't have to write any API wrappers because row API itself speaks um, a different set of common query interfaces interfaces that we'll talk about later. And the idea of row API is to load all the data from the remote blob store um, at front into memory. And then after the app fully started, starts up, we can then just serve these data to our users without ever, ever have to touch the uh, remote data stores any, again. And this design also um, enables us to consume streaming table updates from systems like Delta Lake because the row API instance itself can su subscribe to remote up streaming updates as a consumer, right? And then so the end user on the other end can still enjoy, let's say, single digit second um, streaming update read for the data that they will query against. So it's still fairly fresh um, data that they will be able to interact with. And the good thing about this design is in a traditional export to online data store design, you, you will push the data from the compute engine directly into the data store, right? So oftentimes these are large batch write to the data store. So you will have a spike of a large amount of write traffic that will interfere with the read traffic. So every time this export going on, you will see a big spike of read latencies on the API end, which resulted in bad user experiences for your users. But in row API, because we are subscribing to this update as a consumer, we are passively consuming this update. But that means we have full control of over how fast and how much data we need to ingest anytime. So we can have really tight control over um, the impact of these um, write update to the actual production read traffic. And lastly, because row API is designed to be stateless, as you have more users querying the, in, um, the APIs, you can just spin up more row API instances into the cluster and load balance the traffic between them. Right, each API itself contained um, a stateless. You, you can queue any of them anytime you want. You can spin up as many you, as you want. They, they don't talk to each other. They don't have to synchronize against each other. They also consume from the exact same data, data store. So because the data, data are already stored on highly available data stores like S3, um, you can basically have a really highly available 
um, a highly scalable setup, right? Without without much maintenance burdens because all of these services are really simple to understand. They are not complicated databases that you have to learn how to manage. It's um, all in memory, so it's really fast and uh, low latency. And it's just really easy, a lot easier to manage than the typical databases that you have to run by yourself. So uh, the row API itself, it divided into a couple of major components from a design point of view. The first major component is the query front end, right? So this query front end is responsible for translating different common set of query interfaces into um, data fusion logical plans. So these common um, query interfaces we support are REST API calls, GraphQLs, and SQL queries, right? So all of these queries will get uh, transpiled into a uh, log logical plans, which is a single common abstraction for all the uh, all these relational type queries that Go API support. On the other end, it, is, it has a data layer that is able to load data from different file formats, like Parquet, CSV, JSON, Delta Lake tables, and from different storage systems like S3, GCS, Azure, and from even from different relational databases like MySQL and SQLite and um, SaaS services like Google Spreadsheet and Airtable, right? So the, the data layer really understands these different data formats and protocols, and it converts all of them into a single unified abstraction um, as the error record batches. So these are error in memory data structures. And thirdly, we have a execution engine component that ties these two abstractions together. Right, so the execution engine is responsible to convert the data fusion logical plans into physical plans. And it apply these physical plans on these error record batches and produce some output. Here's a more expanded version of the design diagram. So on the left side, you can see that the user can interact with raw API through different query interfaces. We even support, uh, the raw API itself even speaks um, native Postgres wire protocol. So a user can actually query raw API as if it's a Postgres database using you know all the standard Postgres client. And then um, on the bottom side, you can see all different kinds of data sources, formats we can support, load them into in-memory tables. And on the right side, because the whole project is built based on Apache Arrow in memory data, data format, the output of the compute is also in Arrow data format, right? So we can actually support serializing these Arrow data formats in, into different com common serialization formats as well. And as a user of the system, they can specify exactly what kind of encoding or serialization formats they need by setting a special HTTP header. Right, so for the same query, they can choose to get the results back in either JSON, um, PROC, CSV, or message pack, or whatever uh, common formats that people use. And we actually we can actually go beyond relational type compute need. So for example, for the data that we load into in memory arrow record batches, we can actually let the user uh, in the row API config specify two columns, right? one column for the key, one column for the value. And then we can, within row API, we can um, extract and conf convert these values into a, a memory hash map. And then we can able, we'll be able to serve the hash map through a really simple key value lookup query interface. Similarly, we can also, let's say, support um, approximate nearest neighbor vector search use cases. For example, if you have your ML team is training a model and producing all these vectors for different images or videos or text into a um, remote data store, and row API can load these vectors into a memory data structure and um, build a HNSW graph 
of these factors. HNSW is a really popular algorithm for ANN vector search. And then with this, with this um, vector index, we can start serving, you know, ANN vector search queries through row API. So getting started with row API is really simple um, because like I said earlier, it's all written in Rust. We statically compile everything into a single binary. There's no JVM that you have to set up. There is no users base libraries to have to set up. You just have to step one, download the binary. Step two, run it, right? It's, it cannot be simpler than this. And um, I really recommend you to give it a try and see if it will fit your use cases. With all that, I would like to give a quick demo of what it feels like to interact with Row API through its diverse set of query interfaces. The first thing I want to show you is this config file. In this YAML config, we defined three different tables. The first one is named UK cities. This one is backed by a local CSV file. The second table is named SpaceX launches. This table is backed by a remote JSON API. The third table is named properties and it's backed by a Google spreadsheet. To run raw API with this config file, all you have to do is to pass it to the dash C command line argument. As you can see here, Row API loads all the data from different data sources into a memory data structure. And it's also listening on two different ports. The first port is 5432. This port speaks native Postgres protocols. That means you can connect to this port using any standard Postgres client and issue queries to Row APIs as if it is a Postgres database. Second port is 8080. This port listens for all the HTTP REST API requests. So the first REST API request I want to demonstrate is SQL queries. Here, what we are doing is sending a POST request to slash API slash SQL endpoint with a really simple select, select statement in the POST body. As you can see, row API response turns the response in JSON encodings by default. We can also set the same queries to row API using the GraphQL query interface. Here, I'm gonna send the GraphQL queries in the post body as well. As you can see, we're getting back similar set of results. Not only that, we can also set the same queries using a standard REST API. In this case, I want to send a get REST HTTP request instead of a POST request to the tables endpoint. And we can provide the query statement using HTTP query programs here. For examples, I can provide the columns I want to select here using the columns param. And I can also limit the results using the limits params. As I mentioned earlier, as a user to row API, you can also customize the response serialization format using a custom HTTP header. For example, let's say I don't want to get the result in JSON, but I want to get the result back in CSV format instead. We can set a accept header with the CSV format here, and you get back the result in CSV. Another really cool thing I want to demo is querying 
Roll API using standard Postgres client. So here I connected. I'm already connected to Roll API on port five four three two. And what I can do is to select SpaceX launch tables, which was backed by a remote JSON API. And what I'm going to do is to group each launch pad by ID and I'm going to perform a aggregation count to calculate how many rocket launches was launched on each launch pad. I can also query the property tables that was backed by Google spreadsheet that I showed earlier in the config. Here I can provide a filter statement to only return rows that has number of bedrooms that's larger than three and there you go you can also query data from google spreadsheet all i have showed here is only a small subset of what row api is really capable of and there are a lot more features that i've had the time to show off here for example you can query data from different formats like Parquet, and and um, you can also query data from different data um, storage systems like S3, Azure Blob Storage, and Google Cloud Storage. You can also query tables that defined in Delta tables. So imagine you can literally connect Roy API using a Postgres client and query a remote Delta table as if it is a Postgres database. It also has simple key value REST APIs for you to perform really fast in memory key value lookup queries. And if you are interested in learning more about the project, please feel free to check out the repo on GitHub at slash github.com slash row API slash row API. That's all I have for you today, and I hope you like this project. I look forward to seeing you on GitHub. Thank you.